Hi, everybody. I'm here with Professor Jennifer Reynolds, who's a professor at the University of Oregon School of Law. Um, professor Reynolds, Jen, thanks so much for being with us. Well, thanks so much for having me, Noam. It's great to be here. Jen, I, 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 uh, I really appreciate your sharing your thoughts with the student in this course on, on the topic of, of ethics. And there's so, so much to say about this, but I know that, that one issue that has been on both of our minds is this notion that um, negotiation, and particularly positional or distributive negotiation, really brings you to a point where you start to, to view the other in a very utilitarian uh, uh, kind of mode. And like the other is, is an object that you can just reach out and, and t like, like a cow to milk or, or something along those lines. And at some point, you're bound to run up against ethical problems due to that mindset. Can I add a question mark onto that and see where you want to take that? Oh, sure. Well, yeah, I think this is one of the most interesting aspects of uh, negotiation. It's very problematic, and uh, just as, uh, I'm not an expert in ethics per se. I study uh, these issues uh, as part of my negotiation study, and mm -hmm. also as part of my study just uh, as being a law professor. So, mm -hmm. in the course, we show always have a disclaimer that's conditioned on culture, the time that we live in, the people that we are, then this is just my views on on ethical problems and how we can um, work with them. Yeah. So, with that in mind, uh, I think that the reason why ethics are hard to talk about in negotiation is that there are different senses of ethics and different senses of negotiation that are implicated in the discussion. And so ethics can be as simple as you know, the rules of the game or what the conventions of something are. And so you could say the ethics of negotiation have to do with Negotiation norms, right. and in that way, distributed norms are very ethical. Right, everyone does it, right? That's right, exactly. Yeah. You know that you're supposed to haggle. You know that you're supposed to bluff. Um, you know that you're supposed to get the most that you can, and that's what you should want. Um, and so that's one way of thinking about ethics. Another is thinking about it in the more philosophical sense of rules of morality. Yeah. How do you treat the people? What does it mean to be in uh, communion with others, what does it mean, how do you treat yourself? And so these two senses of ethics, I think, uh, create a, a pretty difficult tension in negotiation, because negotiation itself is defined many different ways. Yeah. History defines it as back and forth communication um, in which some interests are shared and some are different. This is a very neutral kind of yeah. idea of negotiation is sort of a puzzle that you're trying to figure out. Right. And then I believe that um, uh, but most people think of negotiation as uh, getting what you want. Yeah. Um, the process by which I've heard it described as um, getting the other side to say yes to what you are asking for. Yep. So, you know, the, the sense that there's uh, something that you're trying to achieve and the other person is just staying in the way, either an obstacle or the thing that has the thing that you think right. you would like to have. And, um, and so you need to get it from that person. And so the intersection then of negotiation and ethics is that it creates issues around how you think about the other person, yeah. how you think about what the other person wants, how you think about um, yourself, and how you think about what you want. And this ends up bringing up just a myriad of interesting issues around truthfulness and how you parse mm -hmm. things, how you frame things, yeah. and whether you take advantage of weakness yeah. or how you protect yourself from being taken advantage of. How much manipulation is appropriate? How coercive can you be? Um, and then how do you manage the competing values of what, what you want, what they want? But what if you want them to have what they want? Is that legitimate? I know that I have um, a student here, for example, who often will try to give the other person what he wants or she wants before they get what, them, what they themselves want. Yeah. And I have to teach them sometimes to stand up more for themselves. Right. I also have students who care nothing for what the other person is interested in, uh, who are completely competitive for watching the room, and I have to teach them to think about the other. But what is this balance I'm teaching them? Right. Is, this something, is this my uh, view of uh, morality, or is this something, is there something to be said for uh, seeking um, in negotiation that that balance of interest. It doesn't just assume that it's all about getting what you want. 
you know, sometimes I think about that in a sense of um, that there's that there's ethics with a big E and ethics with a small E. Um, and, and lowercase ethics has, has to do with, you know, as you say, the norms of the game and what everybody's doing it, so I might as well. And what can I kind of along the lines of what can I get away with? Or, you know, what does the law let me do? Um, how far can I, can I take this? And I, I often think that that's the kind of ethics that we talk about when we talk about ethics in negotiation. I know that certainly when we when we talk about negotiation ethics in the legal context or as we teach it to lawyers, I, I often run into that, that we're actually we're not talking about ethics in the moral sense that you just described. We're talking about what it does to your reputation as a, as a, as a lawyer. Are you considered a straight shooter or not a straight shooter? And what does that mean for the future? And we talk about, so what does the model code of, of conduct, of lawyer conduct, have to say about that? Are you allowed to or are you not to? So I, I would call that, you know, ethics with a lower case, whereas you're saying, wait, but there's also, there's ethics with a capital E. There's ethics, which is, we're here, we're engaging with another human being. And what does that mean? And on the other hand, as teachers, I hear the strain as a teacher. You're saying, uh, as a teacher, I'm trying to teach my students to, you know, to, to take care of themselves, which is an ethical thing to do, to take care of them and theirs. And on the other hand, I'm also counterbalancing that and saying, um, you know, c care for others is not out of place here. Um, and that's kind of a reflection of the, of the ethical dilemma, I think, that, that everyone goes through or could go through, or perhaps you're kind of reflecting that everyone should go through that when they are in a situation, you know, uh, uh, with another person. I think that's right. I think that you're exactly right that there is ethics with a little e. You have the little constraints on one's behavior. They're pretty broad constraints. Yeah. I mean, you can't commit fraud. I think that that's something that, uh, you know, applies to everyone. As far as, you know, I mean, that, that's pretty, that's a pretty wide meadow yep. then for you to be saying that. It's a little, Right, there's uh, the model rules to consider. You would think for everyone, reputation is a concern, but, you know, especially maybe for professionals. And so people who are um, negotiating with lawyers have to take that into account as well. I think, though, that the, the important kind of deep considerations of the capital E ethics um, are very relevant in a, in a course such as this one where you're learning about negotiation because one thing that you need to be mindful of as you learn negotiations is what kind of beliefs and assumptions you're beginning to take in. Yes. And to the extent that you are, you've decided to give up the belief that the other person is important or that your interests are the ones that matter the most. I was recently at a negotiation course. I was helping with a negotiation course, and somebody said, um, well, as we all know, the goal of negotiation is to meet our interests well, the other side's interest, um, uh, what did they say? Our interest, well, the other side's interest is good enough, and third party interest tolerably. And they meant third parties as in people who are not at the negotiation but weren't yeah. affected by it. And the idea was you didn't want to make them so mad that they somehow interrupted the agreement. And this was said as though this is something that is universal, that we all agree Everyone, on. Right. That our interests are number one, the other person's not number one, but, you know, good enough that they agree, and then third parties tolerably. And I thought, do we really have to believe that? And is that necessarily something that we want to believe? And I think that um, that the uh, the challenge of negotiation, especially studying negotiation, is to figure out what exactly, what assumptions you, you want to bring into negotiation, and be mindful that you make choices all the time when you take the assumptions to the negotiation. And it's not to say that we have to be thinking every time of every everybody. As you say, there is something to be said also for self-care, you know, for asking for that raise, for not necessarily believing your boss when he or she says, oh, we really can't do that, or you're being greedy, or whatever, you know, whatever sort of manipulation yeah. they see that on you. You know, recognizing that there's a certain, there's a certain boundary that one needs to have. Um, and at the same time, resisting sort of the minor uh, assumption of um, some of these, I don't know what you call them, meat-oriented values. And it's, just, and it's not, it, it, it's, it's a difficult subject to talk about because it's so, there's so many different prongs that come into play. 
And um, as I said, as a teacher, I always am looking for the balance, but I'm not even really sure where that balance comes from. Mm-hmm. It may come from just a set of assumptions on myself I'm not conscious of, um, a, a sort of normative impulses that I'm trying to then uh, express in my teaching. But I think that um, regardless of where you end up on the issue, it's, it's always useful for a negotiator to be mindful of what assumptions around what makes for a good outcome, what are all for the people, what are all for third parties, and why. Yeah. I think that it's really useful for negotiators to be mindful of the assumptions they make around this. And, and, and I, think, I think especially that what you're saying is um, don't let the fact that you've walked into a negotiation room uh, make you let yourself off the hook of whatever it is your ethical balance is outside of the negotiation room. In other words, when, when, and I'm sure you've seen this with students in, in class who might be one type of person and then you, you set them up in a, in a negotiation situation and they start acting in a very, very different way. And when you ask them, how, why did you do that? They say, well, because it was a business situation or because, uh, you know, it was a negotiation, so I have to act that way. And I hear you saying, switching that to real life. When we walk into real life situations, we are still human beings interacting with real human beings. That doesn't mean that we need to give them everything that, you know, that they want any more than in any other situation. But it does mean that we, if we let ourselves off the hook of remaining ethical due to the fact that there's somehow a, a frame of negotiation around this, then we're not being true to ourselves. I think that's right, and I think we're capitulating to um, a set of, of external norms that may or may not uh, be what we want, so true to yourself, and may not even be good for the situation. Yeah. And, and it's the case that if people go into business negotiations, for example, thinking that the way you act is to be um, very sharp and very unfriendly or very competitive, they might actually end up not coming to the deal that they want or a deal that right. is as good as they could have gotten, as they could have they just been more cooperative, more collaborative, but they're maybe even true to themselves. And so yeah. I think if these norms can actually end up these ethics, um, with a little e can actually end up getting in our way because um, where do we learn these? Probably most of these we learn from the T V. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And and they've been reinforced through experience without necessarily knowing whether the experience is a good experience or a bad experience. It's just the way the way we do business around here, so to speak. Uh, let's go back to um, let, let's go back to talk to talk about engaging with others because you know sometimes we're in a situation where um, where you know that the other party really is playing by those norms. Um, I'm, I'm challenging us here, and I don't know the answer to it. But the, you know, the other side is, is is saying, "No, I really, I can't do any better for you, and I got another buyer on the line, right? Um, uh, uh, so you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to pay me an extra two thousand, or there's no deal." Now, uh, you know, there's a play. You know that, uh, uh, um, and you're somewhat tempted to say, "Oh, that's great, because I actually have another source to buy it from, and and it's gonna cost me even less." even if you don't have one of those. I'm not going to put you on the spot, but putting you on the spot, what do you do? Well, yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. Actually, um, uh, I think it's, in some ways it's easier if you know that they're playing with the norm. Yeah. The norm, right, because I think that it, it, it puts you a little more squarely into the lower case E ethic space. Yeah. Um, if you know that they're... Uh, that they're bluffing, that they're saying, um, or they might well be bluffing, that they're saying they have another buyer and so you better take it now or, or you know, or you're out. Um, I think that in terms of your own sort of internal analysis, it might be not, not so ethical weird to sort of respond back with a similar kind of, mm-hmm. well, I have another, I have another place I could buy. So yeah. applying a, a kind of Kantian frame of fairness is, you know, if you can turn it about and, yeah. yeah, and I think, that, I think that actually, if you know that they're behaving that way, um, it gives you really good information about whether or not you want to come to a deal uh, under these terms, what your actual interests are, and it refocuses you on your objective criteria. Is this the thing that you want? Is this, and what, what are you willing to pay for it? What is your, what are your, um, what is your walkaway point? These kinds of 
preparation pieces that you've done in advance, and I'm sure you've studied already in the course, and it becomes paramount. And so I think that in some ways it's it's easier when you negotiate when you when you know that they're being um, when you know that they're being sharp when they're playing yeah. the game. Uh-huh. I think what gets actually trickier is if they're really nice, if they're really friendly, if they give you a more um, emotional and human approach, and not necessarily knowing whether or not that's real and whether you should respond in kind. Right. I think it's uh, the, the most problematic to me ethical situations, or some of the most problematical ethical situations, arise around people who use relationships in negotiation. Um, and I say that as somebody who's a very friendly negotiator. Yeah. So I sometimes wonder myself, am I being friendly as a matter of being um Myself, or is this a manipulation on some level when I'm super nice to be potential landlord or whatever it is? Well, maybe maybe you could give an example, and and I think that you know an example that's a little more subtle than let's say when you're when you're selling your house, so you know baking the fresh cookies to have the smell wafting through the air. Um, can, can you share an example of of a, a, a niceness that you asked yourself, wait, might that be a manipulation? You know, every bit as much as I have another quote on the line. Well, of course, now that you've asked, it's hard to think of a, a good one that's <laughs> sort of back story. But yeah. it's, um, I think it's as simple as um, one thing I think we could all relate to is, uh, is simple flattering. You know, flattering somebody, yeah. uh, somebody who might be in a position of power and you want them to come give like a lecture at your class. Right. Or you want them to do a speaker at your symposium. Or you want to... I don't know. Get promoted. Get that. Get the. Uh, get a the, the project that you're looking for. Um, there's a lot of different ways to to speak to somebody. This is so hard to talk about in some ways. Uh, because it cuts. It cuts to, in essence, the core of how we get by and get what we want. And oh. just as there were many people, I think, who were listening to the first half of this discussion. And saying, oh, wait, I actually do kind of use some of those tools uh, in order to, you know, once I walk into a negotiation, and maybe I'm not 100% comfortable with them. Uh, you know, and people who use other types of tools are now looking into themselves, you or me, and saying, hey, wait, actually, sometimes I do use flattery. Um, yeah. It, yeah. All the tactics run the range from, you know, ingratiation yeah. to violence. Yeah. So it's not, it's, it, you can't obviously, you can't just really apparently say, you can't say that somebody is apparently being coercive because they're, um, uh, being, uh, because they're being angry. Right. Or, or, you know, showing a lot of, of rage or whatever it is, or, or, um, or being insulting. It's, it's very much, it's all stuff that people can be coercive and be being very nice. Yeah. And, so the, yeah. real, the real trick then is to understand, I think, for yourself when you're doing this or not doing this. Yeah. For others when they might be doing it or not doing it. And again, in terms of the way other people treat you, um, I think that the most important thing to remember is is to rely on objective criteria, the extent that you can. And uh, I know that you might have a separate session on trust, growing trust, and and um, being trustworthy and that sort of thing. So we don't have to get into all that now. But that that that's kind of what I'm planning as a follow on course to this one and I'm glad that you've piqued everyone's interest. Cool. Uh the uh but with respect to behaving ethically, I think that this is actually a fairly to take some rigorous self examination to know when you're behaving manipulatively or coercively in a nice way. Yeah. Using nice manipulate. And then whether or not that's acceptable. I don't think that it's, that it's, and perhaps this is not correct, and I will go back later and we can't. But it seems to me that, that, um, coercively being nice is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just something I think that you must be aware of when you're doing it. You know, not that, 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 that you are trying to get something by being nice. And so the, um, ethical questions, I think, then, uh, sort of go around whether or not 
that choice, that strategic choice, yeah. is in line with your values, right. and whether the consequences are defensible as a matter of, I don't know, I guess objective justice, whatever. <laughs> I, I think you're, you're demonstrating so well the point which you reach, even when you do start thinking about these things, you reach this point that, okay, now I know what to think about. Do I still know what the bottom line is? And the answer is, in the end, going to be a, a very, very subjective and contextual answer. But uh, uh, what you're suggesting is that if, if you want to bring yourself to the point of being an ethical Negotiator, you have to bring yourself up to that point of being able to look it in the eye and saying, this is what I'm considering doing, whether it's considering using some sort of coercive power on the one hand, or on the other hand, using some sort of uh, coercive warmth uh, on the other. Um, either way, there is a human being on the other side, and I am about to uh, use this force in order to convince persuade and affect this other person and and what does that what does that mean and then hopefully you'll know the answer that's right and what does it mean and and to keep in mind that sort of community around how much power you actually have i think that there's a uh, um i think it's important when you are thinking through these ethical issues to recognize the power you have you know to recognize that you might be that you can manipulate especially the more and more you study this stuff um, the more things you will learn that are manipulative, you'll learn about all kinds of heuristics, for example, that cognitive biases that can um, push people one direction or another as a general matter. Right. And so, just as it's And so, there's a lot of responsibility that goes along with having this kind of awareness and practicing these kinds of skills. But at the same time, I think we have to remember um, that other people have agency Right. and power and skills themselves. And so it's not, it's, you aren't, unless I guess you're negotiating with a child or somebody who is uh, demonstrably weaker than you, not an, not an adult, not um, somebody who's competent, then you are, in, uh, you are, uh, it's not on your guests that they are submitting to your manipulation, you know, beyond your, uh, outside of their own interest. Right. And so, there's a balance also to strike, too, with how much power and control you actually have. Right. And then it's not it's not out of place to, to say, well, you know, they're grown-ups and they're making their own decisions. Um, and, and to some extent, uh, uh, saying that isn't shirking uh, absolutely, uh, uh, you know, our ethical responsibility to consider things. But it certainly it's it is one thing that uh, that we can take into account, and that's that's uh, uh, to some to some extent it's respectful of the human uh, who who's opposite us. I think that's right, and I think it's very important um, to keep that in mind because in, in many situations in which we we negotiate, and I'm thinking specifically of issues that women have around negotiating for money, I think that it's easy for them to get pushed into a situation where they're made to feel as though they're inappropriately using their negotiating power. So yeah. They're inappropriately asking, or they're um, they're they're being greedy, or there's there's something there's something coercive about the way they're behaving. And it, it, I think for people who have these tendencies and these concerns about um, appearing to be asking for too much, yeah. it's very important to remember that the other person has agency, choices, the ability to um, resist their coercion to say no, yeah. and that any so that so that so that the person the asker doesn't internalize too much um, concerns about overreaching. Yeah, and and I think that that's that's so important. Sorry, last sentence. The other person needs to, that you can expect that the other person will push back if you're overreaching. Right. You're not you're not you know working with it for it. Right, so to confuse the issue even more, um, in this back and forth of, I consider it, but wait, but there's also the other side, and I consider it, but wait, there's also the other side, you're suggesting I consider ethical considerations, but there's also the possibility that I'm having these ethical considerations um, as part of a, 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 of a greater process of bargaining against myself that we so often do in our own minds, 
um, in order not to confront the other, in order not to raise difficult issues, in order not to make what seem to us to be, you know, a, a, a large request from the others. So it could be that um, that overthinking ethics m might be a way of shooting ourselves in the foot um, in a way that really has nothing to do with ethics. It's just another voice in our head that's saying, oh, you really shouldn't go that far. You really shouldn't ask for that. It's really not, it's really not okay. Um, and we have many of those voices in our minds, and ethics would be only one of them. And another one would be, you can't ask for that. It's crazy. You can't ask for that. You know, what do we think of you? You can't ask for that. Uh, what if she says no and walks out the door? And another one of those would be, you can't ask for that. It's not right with a capital R. Um, and we need to, uh, to recognize, even as we're doing ethical thinking, we need to recognize whether the voice in our head is really an inner ethicist or whether it's some other form of, you know, our own self-limitations that we're imposing on ourselves. That's exactly right. I think that there's, um, uh, there's a good community we all have with four different positions. And those, those fears often, I think, speak um, I'm looking at this and they, they, they think, it, think that a certain thing would be wrong. Yeah. You know, be, so, for example, to talk to the example, asking for money. You know, the, the idea that that is just a bad thing to do, um, a greedy thing to do, a cheaper thing to do, not a classy thing to do. I mean, there's a whole group of, yeah. of associations that go with, um, asking for money that uh, I think that can masquerade as ethical yes. issues or sort of character issues. Yes. And that's something I think that is worth the, quite a close interrogation for everyone is to figure out um, uh, the difference between those things. But it's, it's really not easy. And I think that it's um, that, that the real challenge again is the negotiation is to recognize that uh, both the, the fact that you're dealing with another person introduces ethical issues because of the way you treat them and also the way you're treated and um, and the limitations of your own understanding of what those things mean. What it, you know, and so all you can know, is, is, as they say, is your own intentions, right? Yeah. And so the extent that you know what it is you're doing and what you intend to do, there are impacts that your behavior has, but that is the key first step. If you had to give our students in this course one last takeaway, after you've done such an amazing job of putting the person back into negotiation, one takeaway on ethics, what would it be? Well, that's very kind of you. I feel like I've, I've made a real uh, uh, a jumble of all of these issues. Oh. Because they are very jumbled. And I think that the, but that is kind of the takeaway that I would give you, which is uh, simply that negotiation implicates issues of capital ethics and morality, uh, regardless of whether or not we are aware of it. And so it's important to note that you make ethical choices when you negotiate, even if they aren't apparent to you or even if they aren't conscious. Yeah. And this is not to make everything feel heavy or to uh, make a person feel guilty for asking for things or whatever. It's just to say that it's happening. And um, I think a good negotiator is mindful of, of these choices and regularly, periodically, reviews uh, whether or not these choices are in keeping with his or her own internal compass and moral code. And so I think that, you, that that's the major takeaway from this very, very conversation is that um, it's a check-in. It's a check-in with yourself. And reflect back and just see whether or not things are still in alignment. Jen, thank you so much for all of this. Thank you, Noam. <laughs> it's been so nice to be here. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Jen.